Your faith is not yet complete. It's not camel. It's not perfect unless I am more beloved to you than yourself, your parents, everything. And then Sayyidina Omar, he, he went and he did, uh, he had to dubbo. He, he thought about this very hard. And he came back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to Ya Rasulullah, Inni la uhibbuka akthar min kulli shay. Hatta nafsi alati bayna jambayya. I love you more than anything, even more than my own self. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-an, Ya Omar, Al-an, now your faith is complete. Now your faith is complete. So the path to love is ma'rifa. The path to loving the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the path to loving Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is having gnosis or knowledge of them. And we see examples of this amongst the Sahaba. We have Musa ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu who was a celebrity amongst the Quraysh when he was non-Muslim. He was a najm, he was a celebrity. He had a new thoban every day. He was a very young man, very beautiful man. Right? He, would, he was a trendsetter. You know, like celebrities, they, they make trends for people. If a celebrity is doing something with their hair, we want to do that as well. Well, not us, inshallah. But generally, people want to copy celebrity. They make taqlid of famous people. That's Musa Abu bin Umar. And then he became Muslim, and his parents cut him off financially. Completely cut him off. So now, and he was in his teens at the time, 18, 19 years old. The Prophet Sallallahu sent him to Al-Habasha, to Abyssinia. He comes back a few years later, he walks into the haram. He's wearing a tattered thob with, with patches. And his skin was rough. He was barely recognizable. And the Prophet Sallallahu looked at him, and he started crying. Buka'an shadid. He started crying profusely. And he said, لَقَدْ رَأِيْتُ هَذَا وَمَا بِمَكَّةَ فَتًا مِنْ قُرَيْشْ أَنْ عَمُوا عِنْدَ أَبَوَيْهِ نَعِيمًا مِنْهُ ثُمَّ أَخْرَجُهُ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الرَّغْبَةُ فِي الْخَيْرِ فِي حُبِّ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Oh, come up, Allah, alayhi salatu wa salam. He said, Verily, I saw this person in Mecca, and no one was more blessed by his parents than he was. And then he left all of that for the intention of good and out of love for Allah and his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's many examples of this. The, the, the ulama say Salman al-Farsi, who was, his father was a Zoroastrian, he was a fire worshiper. Salman traveled to Iraq, became a Christian, Allahu alam. He spoke to priests and, and, and Christian ulama who told him to go to Hijaz. He walks into the masjid called Quba and he uh, walks behind the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet had firasa, he has uh, basira, he has discernment. So the Prophet knew what he wanted. So the Prophet lowered his thob a little bit. And bayna kathifayhi, in between his shoulders is an alama, is a, a birthmark. And when Salman saw that, the ulama said, دَخَلَتْ فِي جِسْمِهِ مَحَبَّةً مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِي جِسْمِهِ مِنْ فَوْقَ رَأْسِهِ إِلَى تَحْتَ قَدْمَيْهِ That the love of the messenger entered into his body from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. Right? So this is, this is what we're after here. There's, other, there's many other demonstrations of love, um, uh, of, of the importance of love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger of Allah. Of course, we know the story of uh, or the hadith Qudsi of uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying upon the tongue of his messenger Muhammad, he says, my, my servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved by me than his fara'id, than his obligatory acts of worship. This is the most beloved thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَا يَزَالُ يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بالنوافل. And then he continues to draw close unto me with extra credit, extra prayers, extra fasting. Uh, and Umrah and things like that. Superrogatory acts of worship. Hatta uhibba until I love him. This is one way of becoming beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doing extra credit. Now many of us, we might say, well I can't do the extra credit. I don't have time and I have to work and I can just do the fara'id. So we take solace in another tradition of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which a Bedouin came to him. He said, Ya Rasulullah, mata sa'a. When is the hour? Right? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he didn't give a date because no one knows the date except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he asked him a question. He answered a question with a question, a better question. Well, ma adat salaha. What did you prepare for it? La shay'a, nothing. And the the muhaddithin or the the scholars of hadith, they say this man just did the fara'id. When he says la shay'a, then he just did the the bare minimum. But then he said illa anni uhibbu Allah wa rasula. But I love Allah and His Messenger. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said al maru ma aman ahabba. A person will be with those whom he loves. Right? So, if we don't have time for nawafil, then we have to increase in love for Allah and His Messenger. You see? And this is something that we want to attain. We learn about the Messenger because we want to have closeness to Him. This is called ma'iyya. This is called qurb. 
We want nearness to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We want to be his next door neighbor in Jannah. This is totally possible. We can attain this. It's not impossible. It's conceivable for us to do this. There was a man named Rabia ibn Ka'ab who brought the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a bowl of water for the Prophet to make wudu. Just a bowl of water. The Prophet said, Sal, ask me for something. He said, As'aluka murafaqataka fil jannah. I ask you for your companionship in paradise. So this is something that the Sahaba, they realized the importance of. This was extremely important, being close to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another way that we can increase our love for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, besides learning about his life and learning about his, his seerah, his, his way of living, is by uh, increasing our as ala al-Nabi, is increasing our benedictions upon him. Saying benedictions upon the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is a, an amr in the Qur'an. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala uses a fi'l amr. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. And then a maf'ul mutlaq at the end. For double emphasis. This is something good for you. Allah is giving you a command. Send blessings upon him. A man named Ubay ibn Ka'b. He came to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, how much of my daily uh, uh, adhkar, my daily dhikr, should I give to the uh, benedictions upon you? as ala al-Nabi. He said, uh, uh, he said a quarter of it. And the Prophet said, that's good, but more is better. He said, nisfuhu, half of it. He said, that's good, but more is better. He said, thalatha arba, three quarters of it. He said, that's good, but more is better. He said, kulluhu, all of it. He said, have a jayyid, that's good. All of your afkar can be as ala al-Nabi. And this is a form of worship. And this is how we attain the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We love His beloved. This is why Allah loves us. We love Allah's beloved, therefore Allah loves us. And we follow His beloved. A group of people came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, inna nuhibbullah. Verily, uh, it's the old messenger of God. We love Allah. Inna nuhibbullah. We love Allah. And then the ayah was revealed. Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni yuhbibukum Allah. Say, if you really love Allah, you have to follow me. And this is what Allah is telling the Prophet ﷺ to say, قُلْ If you really love Allah, you have to follow the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. You cannot expect to be beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by rejecting His beloved. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You see, rejection of the beloved of Allah, rejection of the Messenger of Allah is a rejection of the one who sent Him. This is extremely important. And there's... Uh, there's different things that the ulama mention about um, uh, 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 this, this longing to see the, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which again is conceivable for us to see him in a dream or an awakened state. It's conceivable. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions this. If you see me in a dream, it's really me. In another hadith, if you see me, if you, whoever sees me in a dream will see me uh, while he's conscious. Right? These are sound hadith. So there's a story of a man who came to an alam and he said, yeah, Shaykh, I want to, I want to see the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a dream. So the Shaykh sat him down and he gave him all of the salty food to eat. Maybe, perhaps you've heard the story before. All of the salty food. So this man's eating, right? And he's eating and he's eating, but the Shaykh is not giving him anything to drink. Right? There's no water. It's just salty food. And he's too embarrassed. You know, he has he's too modest to ask the Shaykh and I have some water because this is very salty. So he didn't say anything. And then the Shaykh said, "Okay, come back tomorrow. Go home and come back tomorrow." Uh, so he comes he comes back the next day. And he says, and he says, Ya Shaykh, when I, I can't believe I, I had this amazing dream of waterfalls and rivers and lakes, and it was raining and I was sweating. There's water, water, water everywhere, right? And he said, Why is that? And he said, Because you you long for water, you thirsted for water. When you thirst for the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then you will see him in your dream. But very few of us attain this station, right? Now there are certain du'a, and we can go over them in this class if you like. There are certain du'a that. Many of the ulama have stated uh, has been a means, a, a, a sabab by which they have seen the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a dream. And we can probably, I can probably pass those out a little, uh, write, it, write it on the board or something. There's, there's confirmed du'a, but ultimately it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa taala. Ultimately, we take from the asbab, we take from the means because the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam took from the means, right? But ultimately, it's a gift. Okay. So. Now, in this class, um, we taught this class before, it was 16 weeks. Um, we made a lot of comparisons between uh, like Judeo-Christianity and Islamic beliefs. Um, we got into some like, apologetics with regards to Syrian literature. I don't know if we have time to do that in this class, though. Um, we might just um, skip that. It's going to be very much a, an edited or abridged, a mukhtasar version 
Uh, but we'll try to hit every every chapter in the book. We'll get to the textbook in a minute here. Um, so our, well, right now, our primary text is this book here. Uh, I suggest everyone get a copy. Uh, it's called Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His Life Based on the Earliest Sources. Uh, it's by Martin Lings, okay, who died in 2005, Miladi. He was born in Manchester to a Protestant family, so he was a convert. He was a student of C.S. Lewis, who was a Christian apologist and philosopher. He wrote these books, uh, you know, the Narnia books. Have you heard of these things? The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe. You know, such random objects. Right? The elephant, the Easter bunny, and the ironing board. <laughs> um, uh, so, so if you, so in that movie, for example, I don't know if you've seen the movie, there, there are a lot of Christian undertones, right? And our children watch these things and they kind of take it in. And it could be dangerous. We just have to kind of, you know, like the lion, he dies, he's killed, and he's resurrected. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah, things like that. It's very Christian in its message. Uh, C.S. Lewis was a friend of uh, Tolkien, who wrote the uh, Lord of the Rings series, which also has a lot of Christian archetypes, a lot of Christian iconography, imagery, you know, like the, the final scene, you know, as it were, Armageddon, Gandalf the White, you know, on his horse coming down and defeating the, the armies of evil, so on and so forth. It's right out of the book of Revelation in the Bible. So these types of things you have to be careful about when our children watch them. In uh, 1939, he moved to Egypt. He was forced to leave in 1952 because of British activity in the region. He came back to England at Oxford and did a PhD in Arabic. Um, uh, he's very influential uh, in Islam's answer to modernity and westernization of the global environment, and an advocate of meaningful interfaith dialogue. And right now, actually, a lot of Muslims don't know this, but Muslims and Christians are, are having interfaith dialogue at, at the highest levels of scholarship. You have, you have Muslims uh, like the Alawi Sadat in Yemen who have transmission from the Prophet وسلم, who are meeting with the Archbishop of Canterbury or going to the, the Vatican, Right? They don't televise these things, though, because it's not good for ratings. They'd rather show some stupid show where you know, there's a sleeper cell in New York and they want to blow something up or something stupid like that. Right? But, but if, if they show these things, very powerful. Right? You see Muslims and Christians at the highest level of scholarship, and they're having a meaningful discourse. Right? So this book, actually, in 1983, it won an award. There was a, uh, the National, what's it called? The National Sira Conference in Islamabad. Uh, and this book was selected as the best English seer ever written. Right? And there's other, there's other ones that have been written, Sealed Nectar. Karen Armstrong was a former nun. She wrote a pretty good one. Montgomery Watt, who's a Christian uh, Orientalist, he wrote one um, uh, in, in the 50s. It's pretty good, though. It's very um, objective. William Montgomery Watt. I think Tarek Ramadan also wrote one. So... The book isn't perfect, okay? There's, there's, there's errors in this book. No book is perfect, except for the Quran, right? Every book has errors. Uh, but we're going to use it because it's probably the most correct, and the language is the most uh, eloquent, right? He's, he's a, a Shakespearean scholar. He knows Shakespeare like the back of his hand. Rahim Allah Ta'ala. And I say that about Martin Ling, it's not about Shakespeare. Although he might have, Allah Adam might have been Muslim, I don't know. Sheikh Zubair, right? As Sheikh Hamza says. Um, so that's the thing. If you're going to write about the Prophet وسلم, you have to use the best language, right? You have to have very beautiful language. When you translate his hadith, you have to have very beautiful language, and that's why his 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 wordology and his phraseology is very beautiful, right? And we have to be careful that when we talk about the Messenger of Allah وسلم, not to ascribe to him something that he didn't say or do. This is uh, this is a kabira. This is a major sin. The Prophet وسلم, said in sound hadith. Uh, he says, "Man kathib, man alayya mutaamidan, fal yatabawa maqadhu min al nar." Or, "Kama qala alayhi salatu wasalam." He said, "Whoever ascribes to me something falsely or lies about me intentionally has reserved his seat in the fire." Right? There's 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 a couple of ruayas of this hadith in the sound traditions. Nasallahu alaihi wasallam. So, our supplement supplementary literature. We'll get to the primary sources of this book in a minute. Uh, so this is kind of like an introduction class. Um, the supplementary literature are called uh, Dala'il and Shama'il uh, literature. So the Dala'il are proofs of prophecy, right? like Imam Bayhaqi. Uh, we're going to use him, and he uses him in this book as well. Shama'il literature deals with inward and outward aspects of the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and probably the most famous book of Shema'il literature is the Shema'il al Nabawiyah by Imam Abu Isa at Tirmidhi, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. Um, and there's other books um, by Qadi Iyad, a Shifa, obviously. There's a book, uh, uh, I don't know if it's in English, it's a contemporary book on Shema'il by Yusuf al Nabahani. Uh, Yusuf al Nabahani. It's called Wasailul Wusul ila Shema'ilul Rasul. And basically he takes, because Shema'il is a very large genre of literature, he takes all of the Shema'il and he puts it into one volume. And he doesn't repeat anything. Right, so it's very useful. It's called the, 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 the Ways, the Means of Arriving to the Shema'il of the Messenger, Yusuf and Nabahani. I studied this book when I was in Yemen. So some of the ulama say, you know, these, these outward uh, descriptions of the Prophet, you know, how, what he looked like physically is not important. Don't worry about that. This is what some of them say. Uh, however, we disagree with that because uh, the Sahaba mention it. Why would the Sahaba mention it? Why would they take time mentioning in very distinct detail what the Prophet ﷺ looked like if it wasn't important? The Sahaba did not waste their time. It's the best generation. Why do they mention that then? Very minute detail. They say that the, <laughs> that the, the, the toe next to the big toe of the Prophet was slightly longer than his big toe. Why do they mention Who looked at that and why would they write it down? Somebody saw that and wrote it down. Because they thought it was important. The most minute detail, they counted according to the Shema'il uh, of Imam Tirmidhi, they, they counted 17 white hairs. Somebody actually went up to him and counted 17 white hairs on his head. He said there's 17. Somebody else said, no, there's 14. Somebody said, I counted 11. Right? So why is this important? It's important because the Muhib wants to hear about the Mahbub. It's important because the lover wants to hear about his beloved. Right? If you love someone, you don't, you don't just want to hear about what they're saying. You want to look at them. You want to, you want you want to you want to know everything about them, everything about them, right? This is how the Sahaba felt about the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The ulama said that Fatima az Zahra died from mahabba of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Imam Busiri died from muhabba of the Messenger of Allah. This literally killed them. The longing for the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is the, the stations that we have to attain. So, Syria literature. Um, the word sirah, uh, comes from a, a, a verb, sarah, yasiru. Sarah means to stroll or to walk, right? Yasiru. This is, so this is madi mudari. This is past tense, this is present tense. The word sayyara, right, which means car also comes from the sayyara and automobile. The word sayyara is actually in the Qur'an. So it's, automobile is obviously a, uh, a new application of the term. When they came and took Yusuf out of the well, it says a sayyara came, right? a conveyance of some sort. Right? So the word sira comes from this root, meaning the way of the Prophet, how he walked, right? how he walked, how he lived his life. Right? So why would somebody write a biography? Can anyone imagine why? Why would someone write a biography? Anyone? <laughs> well, we can say to educate, right? To educate, called catechesis, to educate, to uh, preserve identity, right? Um, to increase love, right? So all of these reasons, uh, to preserve a teaching or a legacy, to preserve the actual teaching, right? There's many, many, you know, in communist countries, the government will pay scholars to write biographies of some of the communist uh, forefathers and they, and they have to make it very positive, right? So obviously this is not an objective biography, right? And we'll see that um, when it comes to Syrian literature with the Prophet Wasallam, the scholars were very objective, right? No one's paying him to do anything, right? Even if you look in the four Gospels in the Bible, uh, you have four very different views about Isa alayhi salam. They're polemical tractates. They're trying to they're trying to persuade people into believing something, right? It's not they're not meant to be historical at all. They're meant to be polemical. They're trying to convert you, right? So this again is not objective. There's a polemical aim. So Syria literature uh, is not a uh, exact science. Okay, it's a distinct science, but it's not an exact science. The reason why we study Syria because other than what I mentioned before, to increase in love and marry for the Prophet Sallallahu The reason the ulama study Surah in depth is because it contains many of the uh, shu'un al-nuzul, or asbab al-nuzul, 
uh, many of the uh, the contexts of Quranic ayat, why a verse was revealed, right? So, if you want to know the context of the verse, the scholars will first go to the Sirah. For example, Allah says in the Quran, "Don't say in nifailun zalika ghadan illa ayyasha Allah." Don't say I will do that tomorrow. Except, uh, don't say I will do that tomorrow uh, without saying insha Allah, right? So that's a that's a, a precept in the Quran. But people want to know why was it revealed? What was the occasion of revelation? The Sha'anun Nuzul, right? So then we go to Sira literature and we find, and we'll study this, inshallah ta'ala, that the Quraysh sent a correspondence to the Jews in Medina and they said, this person is claiming to be a prophet of the uh, God of Abraham. Uh, can you give us some test questions? We can examine him. And they said, yes. They sent a correspondence back. Ask him about the Ruh, the spirit. Ask him about Ruh Qarnayn, right? Ask him about what? Ashab al Kahf. Right? Ask him about these three things. So they asked him about these, sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet said, Inni fa'ilun dhalika ghadan. I'll do that tomorrow. Khalas. And then 15 days go by, and there's no Jibril alayhi islam does not come, there's no wa'i. Right? So many of the Quraysh started mocking the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa You said tomorrow it's not happening. But many of them started thinking, he's not making this up, he's waiting for something to come. Right? Why would he? Why would he embarrass himself like that? Right? And then the verse will reveal: Don't say in me fa'ilun dhalika ghadan illa ayyasha Allah, except if Allah wills. He forgot to say insha Allah. And this is ala uh, arabul bashariya. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has isma. He's infallible, but he has human characteristics, and it's conceivable for a prophet to forget something. It's conceivable to make errors in judgment. It's conceivable. He cannot willfully sin. Right? That's the difference. So this is this is one of the reasons why we study this as well. Also, the purpose of Sirah literature, um, uh, uh, according to the early scholars like Ibn Ishaq, was to in, in a tabari Ibn Jarir at tabari rahimahullah taala, was to collect as many traditions about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as many traditions as it, as they can get their hands on, without expressing any type of value judgment on those traditions. It was just to collect everything they could. Okay, whether it was strong, weak, whether it was fabricated, whatever they can get their hands on. And then they would let the muhaddithin, the scholars of hadith, actually go through the literature and extract things that had strong sanad. Right? There has to be a chain of transmission. This is extremely important. There has to be a strong... So they didn't pick and choose. They didn't discriminate. Sirah literature is not hadith. We have to be very clear about this. Sirah literature is not hadith. Now they quote hadith in Sirah literature. Sometimes they quote a hadith, right? But you have to look at the sanad of some of the stories. Some of the stories have no sanad, right? They're apocryphal stories, right? You, you're not obliged to believe in them, right? So when we look at hadith, there are, there are three grades of hadith, basic grades of hadith, okay? There's hadith that are known as hadith mutawatir, okay, tawatir. They've reached tawatir, multiple attestation. In other words, uh, groups and groups of people have reported the same thing about the Prophet wasallam, Okay? Which makes it impossible for them to have collaborated and conspired to fabricate something. Impossible. There's less than a thousand hadith that have reached tawatir. Less than a thousand. Denial of a hadith that is mutawatir is kufr. Okay? It has dalil qat'i. Right? It has a, a firmly established proof. It's equal to Qur'an. Right? Without a doubt, this is what the Prophet ﷺ said, Hadith Mutawatir. Okay? For example, uh, an example of the Hadith Mutawatir is the traditions about Asharan Mubashirin ibn Jannah. That there's ten men that promised paradise. And the Prophet ﷺ, he promised many people paradise. Many women. Fatima Zahra is a Sayyida, right? She's a, she's a master of the women of paradise. He heard the footsteps of Bilal ibn Rabah in paradise. Hassan and Hussein, the leaders of the youth of paradise, right? But these ten men is established through Dalil Qat'i. It's, it's a, it's a Tawata tradition. That means groups and groups of people from all over the Muslim world are reporting the same thing, right? So anyone who says, Hasha Lillah, that one of the, uh, uh, the, the caliphs that preceded Imam Ali was, uh, died upon Nifaq or Kufr, this is Kufr to say that, because this is established through Dalil Qat'i. Okay? The second grade of hadith is hadith sahih, also called hasan, okay, which is a strong, sound hadith. 
denial of such a hadith is not kufr, but it's very uh, ill-advised to do that. Because probably the Prophet ﷺ said this hadith. Okay? So, mutawatir hadith are used uh, to formulate creedal statements, aqidah. Okay? Mutawatir hadith. They're also used for sharia, for legislation. They're also used um, for, uh, for advice, general counsel to Muslims. Mutawatir. Sahih hadith are not used for creed. Okay? They're not used for creed. Unless the ulama by ijma, by complete consensus, agree on that statement. Okay? They're usually used for sharia, to make sacred law, for legislation, and obviously for advice. And then you have hadith that are da'if, that are weak hadith. And weak hadith are not fabricated hadith. That's a different category. Some people say, don't quote weak hadith because it's probably wrong. No! Weak hadith, as one of our teachers said, is like a C- minus or a C. Right? If you get a C- minus on a test, you pass the test. It's a bad grade. Right? You're probably not happy with it, but you passed. Right? That's a, that's a hadith of da'if. It's not a fabricated hadith. There's some weakness in the sanad, in the chain of transmission. And these are only used for general counsel, not for legislation and not for deriving creedal statements. Okay? So, we have four sources. Usul al-Shara'a. Quran, Sunnah, right? Which is not only the, the uh, words of the Prophet, but his af'al, his actions and his tacit approvals and disapprovals. So Qur'an, Sunnah, Ijma, consensus of scholarship, and Qiyas, right? Which is uh, analogical reasoning based on established precedent. Okay, these are our sources, not serial literature. This is extremely important because a lot of these, a lot of the stories that are mentioned in Sirah that Muslims don't even believe in are being used by Christians, like evangelical Christians, to uh, invalidate the Nabuwa of the Prophet Sallallahu In other words, they're, they're judging our religion by things we don't even believe in. Right? That's not, that's, that's not a proof, that's not a delil against us. If we don't believe in it, how can you use it against us? Again, the purpose of the early historians was not to express a value judgment on any tradition, was to just amass as many traditions as possible because they were trying to be objective. Right? And let the muhaddithin go in and separate. Right? Um, <clears throat> so, so you might come across a story in Syria literature that has no sanad. It just comes from nowhere. It comes from uh, Israeliat tradition. It comes from uh, Jewish tradition. Right? It might be true, right? But you don't have to believe it. There's no sanad. It's just a story. Okay. Uh, so that has to be made clear. You can quote it. It's permissible to quote from like, you can quote from the Bible and things like that as long as it doesn't contradict your aqidah. You can quote it and use it as an example. But if it contradicts then you stay away from it. We have to be very cautious about that. And some of the ulama said, don't even quote the Bible. Don't quote it at all. Just be safe. And some said, the dominant opinion, Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, he says, you can quote it, but be very careful when you quote it. Because many of it doesn't have a sanad. Okay? So the sources of this book, the first source uh, that he uses here is called Sirat Rasulullah. Okay? This is by Abu Bakr Muhammad Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq. Okay? Uh, and this is the oldest complete uh, Sirah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Although uh, there is evidence that Sahaba did write down Sirah and Tabi'een wrote down Sirah. Okay, Urwa ibn Az-Zubair, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, who is the son of uh, Az-Zubair ibn Awam, who is from the Ten Promises of Paradise. Uh, his mother was uh, Asma bintu Abi Bakr al-Siddiq. So the son of Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr, and uh, Az-Zubair, he wrote down Sira literature. But his works are in fragmentary form. They haven't been preserved completely. Right? There's, many, there's many examples, like Wahab ibn Munabbi was from the Tabi'een. He lived at the time of the Tabi'een in Yemen. He wrote down Syria literature. His work is lost, right? but there's evidence that he wrote it. Uh, Abdullah ibn Abbas, who is Mufassid al-Qur'an, right? he's a companion of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He's the founder of uh, the science of Qur'anic exegesis. He's the founder of Usul al-Tafsir, Qur'anic hermeneutics. He wrote down Syria on al on tablets. He wrote down the Syria of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But this is lost. Right? So the oldest surviving uh, complete seerah of the Prophet 
is by Muhammad ibn Ishaq, who wrote it about 120 years after the passing of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's considered foundational, but also very problematic. It's considered very problematic because he includes again many of the apocryphal stories. He just took from any source, right? So it's problematic in the sense that if you don't know how to approach it, it could be problematic, right? And this is a seerah that Christians and you know atheists they love this seerah because they don't know how, they don't know how to approach seerah literature. You don't just take it any tradition. If you go to some of these websites, like whatever I hate Islam.com or something, and I've seen these websites. You go there, there's articles about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then you scroll down to the footnotes. And you know what are they quoting? It says Sirat Rasulillah uh, Ibn Ishaq, and then Ibid 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 Ibid. Same as above, same as above, same. As, very rarely will they quote directly from Quran or Hadith, right? So this is the main thing they attack is Sira literature, okay? Especially Ibn Ishaq's Sira. There's a lot of apocryphal stories in the Sira, in that Sira. Um, but there was a very strong oral tradition amongst the Muslims. It's an oral society. I visited Mauritania. A couple of years ago, and you meet uh, people that are uh, ummiyun. They don't know how to read or write, but they're hafiz of Quran. How can you be a hafiz of Quran? You can't read, write your own name because it's very auditory, right? It's a very oral culture. The shaykh will sit in front of him and he'll recite to him, and he just repeats, and he's got it. That's it, right? So there's still, and it's a pre-modern society. Very, I mean, Mauritania is kind of out in the middle of nowhere, right? Uh, but there's still societies like this. A very strong oral tradition. Okay, they say that the nal- the knowledge of the salaf was in their breasts. Imam Shafi'i would point to his chest. This is where my knowledge is, right? So you know he didn't carry on his books. We know the famous story of Imam Ghazali when he studied in uh, Nizamul Mulk. He studied under Juwaini, Imam Al Haramain. Right? He was a, he was a r- most learned professor, Abu Hamad Al Ghazali. Right? He's coming back from Samarkand and he's He's uh, he's uh, a group of brigands, right? Robbers. They 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 rob him, right? And uh, they want to take his books. And he says to one of them, "Don't take my books. That's my knowledge." And he says, "This is your knowledge. What kind of knowledge do you have that the likes of me can take it from you? You're not a scholar, right?" So Imam Ghazali suddenly realized that I have to memorize this. So he committed in the next two years. He committed all of his notes to memory. Your knowledge is not in books. Your knowledge is in your sabr. It's in your chest. It's in your brain. It's in your mind, right? This is it is extremely important. And some of these scholars say that during their exchange, Imam Ghazali found out that this man was fasting, and he was robbing him. So, he, so as a rebuttal, Imam Ghazali said, "You're fasting and you're robbing me. What kind of Muslim is that?" And the man said, "I didn't want to close all the doors to my Lord. I didn't want to close off all the doors to my Lord." So Imam Ghazali even learned a lesson from that. And it said that many years later, Imam Ghazali was making tawafah on the Kaaba, and he found a man that was clinging to the kiswa. He was clinging to the curtain of the Kaaba and was crying, and it was the same brigand. Right? So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So you leave a door open to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You don't close the doors off. Um, so, of course, you know in Christian history as well. There's also a strong oral tradition, like the Gospel of John was written in 110, about 80 years after Isa alayhi salam. The difference, however, is that Christians believe the Gospel of John is the Word of God, whereas no Muslim believes that Sirah is the Word of God. And the, the Gospel of John, written in Greek, which is not the language of Isa alayhi salam, by an anonymous person, right? whereas we know this is written in Arabic, and we know who wrote it, Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, so on and so forth. There's a major difference. Now the three errors in this book that I'll say now, um, so uh, just to keep in mind, uh, and this is probably uh, something that he did kind of just um, to um, make it easier for Christians to understand, I think. He, he equates Isa alayhi salam in the Christian tradition as being the Logos, right? Which is a divine incarnation, an avatar. He equates that with the Quran. He says Jesus is the Word made flesh, the Quran is the book made word, or the, the Word made book, right? Uh, so this is true up to a point. We believe the Quran is uncreated, and the Christians believe that Isa alayhi salam is uncreated. But Christians also believe that Isa alayhi salam is God, hashadillah, and that he's separate and distinct from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the Father in heaven, whatever you want to call him, whatever the Christians call him. Right? Whereas we don't believe that the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is deity in and of itself. It's an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's something to be careful about. The other thing he mentions is at the uh, Fatha Mecca, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I wouldn't know where he's getting this from. Um, he, he Obviously he has a source of some, he didn't just make it up. Uh, we have a good opinion of him, rahimahullah ta'ala, he's a very blessed man. Uh, Martin Lings was also known as Shaykh Abu Bakr al-Siraj, rahimahullah ta'ala. That was his Muslim name, Shaykh Abu Bakr al-Siraj. He died about five years ago, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala. He says, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he destroyed all the idols except an icon of Maryam and Isa. He left that in the Kaaba. So this is not true. He didn't leave anything. He didn't leave any iconography in the Kaaba. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so it's a, it's not considered an insult to destroy an icon of Isa alayhi salam. It's considered actually a praising of Isa alayhi salam to do that. Because nothing can capture the essence of Isa alayhi salam. No artist can render anything that comes even close to the essence of Isa alayhi salam or any of the prophets. Right? The other thing he mentions is, uh, and he implicates this, is that when uh, the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam to Zainab bin to Jahsh is when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam sees her and then suddenly he's enamored with her. Right? Uh, so this is something that we reject completely. It, he implies that's what happened. All of the marriages of the Prophet وسلم, are by command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? When Najmi Ida Hawa, Madalla, Sahibukum Wama Gawa, Wama Yantiku Anil Hawa, in Hua illa wahyu yuha, Allahu Shadidu Kuwa. That the Prophet وسلم, does not speak from his hawa, from his own caprice. He doesn't he doesn't make decisions based on his own hawa, right? His own emotions, his emotional state, right? Uh, this is extremely important. So uh, we'll, when we got when we get to that, um, so these are th three problematic aspects. Again, no book is perfect except the book of Allah. Right? So mistakes are inevitable. Now, uh, in addition to Ibn Ishaq, uh, there is a Mukhtasar of Ibn Ishaq, which is much more uh, um, reliable. It's called uh, the Mukhtasar of Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. It's three volumes. Ibn Hisham. Uh, and basically he went through Ibn Ishaq and removed a lot of these stories that were causing a lot of uh, controversy amongst the early Muslims that Ibn Ishaq took from uh, sources that were not sound. Right? So this is the most popular sirah probably in the world, is the sirah of Ibn Hisham. Okay? Um, <clears throat> for example, he removes the story recorded by Ibn Ishaq, uh, the, the satanic verses story. Right, there's a story, um, and we'll talk about that inshallah. But this is rejected by you know, Abu Bakr ibn Arabi, Fakhradin al-Razi, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Kathir, Qadi Iyad, go right down the line. Right? Complete fabrication. He also quotes, and this is, if you get the book, um, this is uh, at the end, the, the new copies have this at the beginning. So there's a, there's a page called, here called Key to References. Okay, so these are his sources. Okay, so he's not like making things up. Right? He has sources here. Okay, so he says here, he also quotes from Ibn Sa'ad, it's called the Tabaqat. Um, and then also from Muhammad ibn Umar al Waqidi, Kitab al Maghazi, which is a chronicle of the military expeditions of the Prophet. Also quotes uh, Akbar Mecca by Azraqi. And then uh, uh, Ibn Jarir uh, uh, at Tabari, Tarikhul Rusul wal Muluk, right, the Annals of at Tabari, right, which is extremely important work as well. It's a famous exegete, Mufassir of the Quran. Um, and then obviously he quotes from eight traditional books of canonized hadith. He quotes from the Sound Six, right, Asiha as Sitta. Who can name the Sound Six? Who can name the Sound Six? You heard of Sound 6? What are they? Uh, give me the first one. Bukhari, Muslim, Tilmidi, huh? Ibn Majah, good. Two more. Abu Dawood, good. And Al Nasai. Al Nasai. He also quotes from the Sunan of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, okay, which is a, a great scholar. He's a Mujtahid, right? Uh, and uh, Darimi, Imam Darimi. So these are the eight books of hadith that he quotes. He tries to stay within the Sahih tradition, right? the strong hadith, and the Mutawatir hadith. Finally, there is an occasional reference to Bayhaqi, Kitab al-Sunnah al-Kubra, 
and the Mishkat. He says it was written by Baghawi, but that seems to be an error. The Mishkat was written by Khatib Tabrizi. Um, it's about 6,000 hadith. It's a very beautiful book, the Mishkat. <clears throat> um, so, we'll take a few minutes now. What time is Isha? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock? Okay. We'll take, um, we'll do this on the board then. Next time, inshallah, we'll do a historical overview of what the world was like at the time of the birth of the Prophet ﷺ and why it was so necessary. The world was literally in chaos. What was happening in Europe was unbelievable. There was, there was barbarian hordes everywhere, pillaging and plundering. It was just an unbelievable, the Dark Ages, right? <laughs> so we'll talk about that. We'll quote from a Christian scholar who is a... Uh, he has a, this is a, a text that we've studied in, in seminary at a graduate school level about what the world was like during this period, right around the 6th century. But before we do that, it's important for us to know the lineage of the prophets of Allah. So many of you have already, I've already given this to you, if you, taken, if you took the previous Sira class or the lives of the prophets class we're doing in San Ramon. Um, so it's important to know his lineage, his confirmed lineage. Okay, um, and we can go all the way back to Adam alayhi salam, right? But only names that we know for sure are the ones that he named sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So there's a poet who said, "Wahfad usul al Mustafa hatta tarafi silsilati usulihi Adnana." So remember the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam until you get to a man named Adnan. Fahunaka tuf. When you get there, stop. Wa'alam bi rafghihi ila Ismail kana bil Abi mi'awana. But know that it goes back to Ismail alayhi salam, who was a helper to his father. So uh, obviously the first person on the list is Adam alayhi salam. Okay? The first human being, the first uh, Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, uh, and then the prophecy moved to the second prophet named either Sheikh or Shaykh. Sheikh or Shaykh. There's a difference. It's Seth. So these are Hebrew names, right? They're not Arabic names. Most of the prophets, a lot of Muslims don't know this. Most of the prophets' name in the Quran so Hebrew uh, and are Israelite prophets, not Israeli prophets. There's a difference between an Israelite and an Israeli. Okay, <laughs> Israelite is the the Bani Israel with a Muslim Ummah before the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're not talking about Israelis. We're talking about Israelite. Okay, so the second there was a <laughs> I was at a, um, a dinner party or something, and there was a brother there. He was from Iran, and his name was Yashar. And I said, uh, did you know your name Yashar is a Hebrew name? It means the just one. And his friend next to him started laughing. He said, oh, you have a Hebrew name, uh, you have a Jewish name, you know, this and that. So I said, what's your name? He said, Idris. I said, oh, you mean Enoch? It's <laughs> a Hebrew name. <laughs> Which is the next prophet, actually. Idris, Alayhi Salaam. Enoch. This, this uh, word comes from Darasa. Uh, this is someone who's discipline, who's a learned Idris alayhi salam. So Ibn Kathir, Rahim Allah Ta'ala, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi the lineage goes through Idris alayhi salam. Okay? Um, so then, uh, this is actually, if I, have a, if I have an arrow, that means it's a direct son. This is a dotted line, which means there's a few generations. We don't know for sure. These are, these are what, this is what we know for sure, okay, according to our sources. We don't want to speculate. And then we come down to Nuh alayhi salam. Okay? And then his direct son, according to our tradition, was a son named Sam, or Shem, right? Uh, so the word Semite, right? Semite, they can say anti Semitic, right? Semite is from his name Sam. He is the forefather of the Semites, or Arabs, or is Israelites. Uh, Al-Lughat uh, al-Samiyat, right, the Semitic languages, Sam. And then we skip a few generations. And we have Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay. وَإِنَّ مِنْ شِيْعَتِهِ لَإِبْرَاهِيمِ So his father, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then the son of Ibrahim alayhi salam, It's Ismail alayhi salam. Right, so Ibrahim means Ab, Ab Rahim in Hebrew. Right? Abu Rahma. Right? 
the, the Father of Mercy. And then Ismail, right? Sami'a Allah, Sami'a Allah. God heard. Now, after this point, the, the, the Prophet وسلم, did not mention anyone until Adnan. So we don't know, we don't know between Adnan and Ismail alayhi salam. Although some of the scholars, um, they speculate that there was a man named Kedar, who was the son of Ismail, and the reason of Qaidar, the reason why they say Kedar is because there's a figure named Kedar in the Bible who's a son of Ismail, who is very prominent. And the word Qaidar in Hebrew is used synonymously with Arab. Um, so he was a very important figure in the Bible. Allahu Alam. So we just put that in parentheses. So this is speculative, we don't know. Okay. So after Adnan, we have Ma'ad. Adnan Ma'ad. Does anyone know the lineage? Usually children know this. Any, ch any children? Sunday schoolers? Nizar. So Adnan, Ma'ad, Nizar. <coughs> Mudar. Mudar. Adnan, Ma'ad, Nizar, Mudar. Ilyas. This is not the Prophet Ilyas. Okay. This is a different Ilyas. After Ilyas. Mudrika. 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 Like we said, we, we love the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we want to know everything about him. Right? The ulama say that you can tell what a person loves by what their tongue is always saying. So if someone's always talking about their car, my Mercedes Benz, is beautiful, because that's what they love. The tongue reveals the heart. Right? So there, there are youth who know, or, you know, the score of every single World Series since 1901. Right? And you think, well, that's so, that's so useless. Why would you even... Well, I love it. Right? This is our remembering the lineage of the Prophet This is good practice. Khuzayma. Udrika. Khuzayma. Kinana. Udrika. Khuzayma. Kinana. Anadru Anadru Mare Anadru Mare Fihar What's another name for Fihar? Who's Fihar? He's known by a, a more famous name. So you want to? Good guess. Not to say. Quraysh. Fihar is Quraysh. The word Quraysh is diminutive. It's on a scale called Tasghir. Like Hassan and Hussein. It's diminutive. Qarasha means to bite. A Quraysh is a shark. So Quraysh is a nickname and he's a little biter. So maybe they say like when he was a kid or something, he bit something and they kind of, they called him, eh, yeah, Quraysh. Mm -hmm. So it kind of stuck with him. But his real name is Fihrun ibn Malik. Quraysh. This is the Qabila of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His Qabila is called Quraysh. Ghalib. Lu'ay. Ka'ab. 
Morbach. Kila. Sometimes, um, I think uh, they change it to Hakim. So you'll find either Kilab or Hakim. Because Kilab in Arabic has a, has a bad meaning. It means dogs. So but that was his name. But sometimes they say they use it in areas. Kila. Uh, and now, Usay. So Usay was the first one. Around 400 of common era who told the Arabs to stop moving around, to stay in Mecca and build houses. The son of Husay. Abdul Manaf. Abdul Manaf. Hashim. So the Qabila of the Messenger of Allah is Quraysh. That's the tribe. And then there's a Fakhid, there's a clan. Right? The clan is Bani Hashim. Okay? In Hashim, you have Dr. Hashim. known lineage, names we know for certain from tradition. And of course, I mean, we can go further. Um, Abdullah had a brother named Abu Talib. Right? He has a son named Ali. The Prophet has a daughter named Fatima. They marry with Hassan and Hussein. And then they have their own lineage. Okay? Um, We'll stop at that point, inshallah. Um, if, any, if there are any issues uh, or any questions now, we can take them or comments. If not, next time, inshallah, we'll, we'll start with uh, the historical context and then also read the first. If you get this book, you have to get the book. I mean, it's not mandatory, but read the first two chapters The House of God and A Great Loss, and maybe Quraysh of the Hollow. The chapter is like a page and a half each. It's very, very short chapters, and there's a lot of chapters. They're very short. Okay. Any, any questions? Yes. So, how do you think you can find this book? So this book you find anywhere. Amazon, yeah. most bookstores, even like Barnes and Noble, whatnot. Can you just write it down for the, the author? The name of the book? Oh, the name of the book and the author. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll hold it up. You can, you can write it. Martin Lings, L-I-N-G-S. Links, very easy to remember. If you guys are interested, uh, before you leave today, just sign up so we try to order it. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Martin Links, just put in Links in any, go to Amazon.com, it'll, it'll come right up. This is his most famous book. There's different editions of it, they have different covers, but and they move things around, but it's the same text. Any other questions? Like I said, there's a lot of information. So we're, we're going to move quickly. Not, uh, after Ibrahim, yeah. there's no prophet, right? So, it's Ismail. Ismail, that's right. After Ismail, all of them are not Allahu Adam. We don't know. Maybe. We don't know. Like, like Kedar could have been a prophet. Allahu Adam. It's not mentioned in our sources. But uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that some of the prophets, we mentioned their stories, some we have not. Most of them. Allah has not mentioned. 
he's, it's conceivable for there, there to have been many prophets because they fall within the prophetic fatra. But definitely there's no prophet between Isa and the Prophet This is confirmed in hadith. There's no prophet between Isa and the Prophet Which yeah. prophecies are like contemporary that you said? What's that? <coughs> Who is in this lineage is contemporary with Isa? Uh, who is in the who is in the lineage of Isa? No, contemporary. Oh, contemporary. Like oh, I see. One. I see what you're saying. Uh, Allah, I mean, this is about this is about 230 years. Another 200, probably. Maybe even around Adnan. Maybe about 600. Allah, I mean, just based on you know this 400 and one two three four you know, six names away, I, I'm sure we can calculate it. Um, that's a good question. Hopefully, it wasn't boring. <laughs> uh, like I said, it's a it's a it's a class. It's you know, our religion isn't. You know, play and amusement. It's, it's it's serious business. We can have fun doing it, and it depends. You know, it's it's just the way we're socialized. As people need to be entertained and whatnot, but you know, people find different things entertaining. I can sit with a sheikh for five hours, and he can explain in a very monotone voice about the sifat of Allah, and I will be enthralled for four hours. But for other people, you know, it takes a little song and dance, and so I'm sorry if I'm kind of boring, but. This is information we have to learn. I can't learn it for you. It's like with the Arabic class. People say, you know, you know, you have to do this and that, and then you have to do the work. You have to memorize. You know, it's, it takes work. Okay. So I, I encourage the children to, because uh, the, the brain of a child is like a sponge. It's ready to absorb. Uh, it's very easy to learn things when you're a child. Learn languages is very easy. Uh, learn information like this. So I encourage the children to come and take notes as well. It'll make it much better. And if you have obviously non-Muslim friends that want to learn about the Prophet they're welcome to come, as long as it's okay with the Masjid board. I don't mind anyone coming in. I go to places, I do lectures, and I see non-Muslims are people that look very strange, and they're probably, you know, working for some agency or something, but I have nothing to hide, or we're teaching love and peace. And <laughs> 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 <laughs>